Hi, welcome to Smeester's Corner. I'm Adam Smeester. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about how to build a strong identity. And this is pretty complex, so this is going to be a little longer probably than some of the other ones I've done in the past. So first off, we're going to talk about what identity is. Then we're going to get into uh, the parts of identity, uh, the parts of identity that are you, and then the parts that you need to build, what to build it around, what not to build it around, um, and what a healthy identity looks like. So for the purposes of definition, identity is how you see yourself and how other people see you too. A lot of people just uh, try to think about how they see themselves, and that's the most important. But it's also how other people see you, how you're perceived by other people, because you might have some blind spots. Identity is who you are. It affects what you do. It affects your decisions. It affects your behaviors. People who have a hard time and have chronic problems with decision-making and behavior probably have some identity issues. Identity has two parts, and both parts have to be what we call integrated. Okay, you have to have a strong sense of both, okay, not one or the other. And those parts are your relationship with yourself and your relationship with the world around you. Your relationship with yourself is called intrapersonal. Okay? It's like the mental part between you and yourself. The other part is your relationship between you and the world around you. It's the social part. We call that interpersonal. And these two have to be integrated. A strong identity has the same identity in both categories. So what that means is you can't just pick one or the other. You can't just tell everybody what your identity is and like expect them to accept it. It has to be integrated. For example, a little kid can't just say, well, my identity is I'm the toughest kid on the playground, okay, which is that in intrapersonal side. Uh, and then everybody else on the interpersonal side, the social side says, yeah, let's check that out. And then all of a sudden, uh, through some physical contact, you just realize that you're not the toughest kid on the playground. They have to be integrated. The same goes in reverse. People, you just can't rely on people to tell you who you think you are and then just take that and decide that that's who you are. Like if people are telling you, well, you're a leader, you're a leader, you're a leader, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't have any leadership qualities. I think people are just saying that to be nice. This is where the cultural values and the religious values also might play a role Okay, in the relationship between you and yourself. Those are very important in identity for a lot of people. So when it comes to identity, you can actually build an identity. And part of it is going to be who you are already, but you have to discover that. Okay, it's not going to be obviously automatic. And you're going to discover that through your whole life. Okay, so your identity might change a little bit here and there. The other part is going to be the part that you need to build. you got to figure out who do you want to be, like the future you. Who are you going to be? So when you're deciding who you want to be and you're trying to build this identity, there are some things that you don't want to build your identity around. So you don't want to build your identity around things that can be taken away from you. For example, we had a guest speaker come to my school and he uh, was just out of college and he told this story, which I, apparently he's made into a TED Talk. Uh, but he in high school, was his identity was he was a straight A student. Um, he was a nationally recognized snowboarder, like wanting to go to the Olympics. He was going to see you and was on his full ride scholarship for snowboarding. He was kind. He was social. He had a good reputation. He was the kid who other parents would come up to him and say, I want my kid to be like you. And that was his identity. Then something happened. I'm not sure quite what happened, but he just said it was a fraternity prank gone wrong. And he got accused of some stuff. And they had to do an investigation. And through the investigation, he lost his scholarship. Uh, he then couldn't go to school. So the straight A student was gone. Um, his reputation was damaged. So uh, the people that he used to associate didn't want to associate with him. So all these parts of his identity, who he had built himself around, was taken away from him. And then he not only had to deal with the stress of the investigation and what was going to happen to him, he had a full-on identity crisis. Like, who, who is he? So if you build your identity around things that can be taken away from you, and then they get taken away from you, who are you? What do you have? You have nothing. So some people will build their identity on good grades. Oh, I'm the straight-A student. Well, what if something happens, and you have to go to the hospital for a prolonged period of time, and then, you know, you have to drop out of school for a while, or something catastrophic happens where you can't focus on school. Uh, what if your identity is built around your reputation? That's good to have a good reputation, but what if something scandalous happens and that's taken away and uh, maybe it's not even true? And then there's always sports. 
Okay, the athletes a lot of times will build their their identity around being an athlete. So like when I was in high school, when I, I was an athlete. That's who I was. I didn't know what else I wanted to do other than just be an athlete. So, and I've seen this happen when, when I played uh, football in college, a lot of the football players, they didn't know who they were outside of being a football player. And then once they graduated, they were no longer a football player and they didn't know what to do. So they try to go play uh, semi-pro football while they're working part-time jobs. And it's, I'm sitting there thinking like, dude, just give it up. You're not a football player anymore. You got to move on. This is the case with Olympic athletes too. There's a really good documentary on Hulu called The Weight of Gold. And they interview all these former Olympic athletes who were the best, uh, who outshined everybody at their sport. And then once they're no longer an Olympic athlete, who are they? They don't have any other skill. They don't know what to do with their life. They don't know what their interests are because their whole identity has been built around being an athlete. And then once that gone, a lot of them become depressed, uh, maybe worse. They think about suicide or they actually try it. Uh, it, it's, and there's nothing, there's no support because their whole identity is written around sports. A lot of guys, uh, once they graduate college, build their identity around their job and their job is who they are. And then once they retire or they, something happens and they get let go, there's an identity crisis because that's who they were. So now I'm going to list off some things that could be part of your identity that can't be taken away from you, that are good, that are will help you have a strong identity. One huge one is the bravery to do hard things. So they have interviewed people who are on their deathbed in hospice care, and there's the, the they've ranked um, people's biggest regrets. So I'm going to tell you what people's biggest regrets are. So looking forward in life, Everybody wants to be happy. They want their kids to be happy. I just want to be happy. But then looking back at life, people's regrets are far different than just being happy. And here's what they are. Here's number three. I wish I had the courage to not let fear hold me back from the things that I wanted to do or the, from the things that challenged me. Okay, it's a courage. They wished, it's all the things they wish they would have done, not the things that they did that they failed at, all the things that they didn't do that they wish they had done they would have had the courage to do. Number two is I wish I had the courage to tell people that mattered to me how much they I really cared about them. That's vulnerability. And the number one regret was I wish I lived the life that I wanted to live instead of the life that people expected me to live. So if you notice all of these, the things that all these three things have in common that people regret the most on their deathbed all revolve around bravery and courage. Here's some more things that can be part of your identity. Being curious. Be, certainty kills curiosity. So if you're a person who's certain on everything, uh, you're not going to be a very curious person, and it's going to come across to people like that. Curious people know that things aren't black and white. They know, they know that there's shades of gray and there's nuance to the world, and they want to figure out what that is. Curious people want to understand, not win the argument, and they want to understand people that they disagree with because they want to understand why. Here's another one. Being a critical thinker. Uh, also, being present with people. Are you constantly distracted when you're hanging out with other people? Or do you give them your full attention? I'm going to list off some more. Being a good listener. Being a servant for other people. Being a strong support for other people. Being vulnerable. Being self-aware. 70 to 80% of people overestimate themselves. They think that they're better at things than they actually are. So they're not very self-aware. 95% of people think that they're self-aware. Because well, who's the last person you met who's like, yeah, I'm not very self-aware? 95% of people think that they're self-aware, but only about 10 to 15% are actually self-aware. Self-awareness is knowing yourself, uh, knowing what your dreams are, knowing yourself, what motivates you, how to motivate yourself, uh, and also how other people see you, which is a big one. Not a lot of people know how other people see them a lot of the time. Here's some more things you can build your identity on. Telling the truth, which is being honest. That's a huge one. If you're not honest and people catch you in a lie, even your friends, there's going to be some doubts every time that you speak <clears throat> in the back of their mind. Being principled, knowing right from wrong, regardless of the circumstances. Having integrity or character. I did a whole Smisher's Corner on character, how you want to be remembered. Um, and that's doing the right thing even when no one's watching. And then the last one I listed was having strength, which is 
You know who you are and you're secure in that. You don't need affirmation and people patting you on the back all the time to know that what you're a good person or you did a good job. You just know it because that's who you are. You did a good job and you can affirm yourself. And that's also not doing things, not doing good things just because of the affirmation you're going to get. So there's a lot of people who do good things, but they need to broadcast it to everybody. You can do good things and not tell anybody. And that's enough for you. For me personally, I, I just listed some things that I try to build my identity around. So for the mental, uh, I listed bravery to do hard things, telling the truth, being vulnerable, being self-aware and doing the right thing. Socially, I listed uh, curious, trying to be present, be a good listener. Now, there is something in your identity called the false self. This is a part of you that takes over all the other parts. So it's still a part of you, but it just stomps on and doesn't let the other parts breathe, if you will. This is the part of you that is externally motivated for self-worth. It needs affirmation. So it uses this part of you to get affirmation. And you need it so often that it kind of stomps out all the other parts. So as an example, for me, um, I realized that I had two false selves. One was the funny guy because I needed affirmation. So the funny guy became like a thing. Um, I got to the point where I would go into a room and like kind of size all the other guys up. Like, is there anybody funnier than me? Is there anybody funnier than me? And I used the funny guy like that was part of my identity is the funny guy. The ability, the ability to make people laugh. But, but then it became more than that. Like I, And I remember a point in my life, I remember thinking, I'm not happy a lot of times when I'm hanging out with people because I feel like I'm putting on a show because I needed to be the funny guy. And the other part of me is the tough guy. Like growing up, I just, I needed people to know that I was a tough guy, that I wasn't weak. And I would do things to try to show that, but those two parts would take over. And then a lot of my striving became to show people those two parts of who I am. So here are some things that I'm going to list off that uh, you can do to help build a positive identity. First of all, build positive relationships. You have to have positive relationships. If your relationships are built on uh, drama, that's not going to work. If your relationships are built on, um, you're just friends with someone because you have a common dislike for another group or another thing, that's not good. So as an example, uh, in politics right now, um, there's been a lot of studies on this, and they say that uh, people in politics... One reason that they're on the side that they're on is because they dislike the other side more than they like the side that they're on. The people from the side that they're on or the policies of the side that they're on. So it's a common dislike. That's not good. So build positive relationships. Another is self-reflection, knowing why you do the things that you do and always trying to get down to the bottom of your motivations. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Having positive self-affirmation. So giving yourself grace trying to love yourself, giving yourself a break. I tend to be kind of hard on myself. So this, I have to do this for myself. I have to take a step back and be like, all right, give yourself a break. Stop beating yourself up over this like little mistake you made. And the last one is build a strong community. You have to live for something greater than yourself. There's got to be uh, a greater good out there that you're trying to live for, that you're a part of, okay, than just being in life for yourself. Lastly, I'm going to list off some signs of a good identity. So here's how you know if your identity that you're trying to build or that you have built is a good identity. These are just some of them. Enjoying being with others and being by yourself. Some people, they got to pick one or the other. They don't enjoy being with other people. And then some people don't enjoy being alone. And some people say that that's, well, extroversion and introversion. But you do have to have a balance. In terms of being alone, I've always told my students that you're never going to be able to be loved the way you want to be loved unless you can love yourself first. And that means you are comfortable being by yourself. Okay, you're, You don't always have to be in a relationship or dating somebody. You can be by yourself for a while. All right, so back to the list. So enjoying being with others and being alone. Allowing others to think and feel differently than you. You can accept responsibility for your choices and actions. You can hear other people's opinions, but you can make your own decisions. So you don't need other people to make your decisions for you. You can engage in activities that you know you deserve and be happy doing those activities. You know what's important to you, what you actually like doing, and you make that a priority for yourself instead of sacrificing everything all the time. Having compassion for people without taking on their burdens because you need to let other people handle their own burdens. You cannot take other people's burdens away from them as much as you might want to or as noble as you think that is, which is what I used to try to do, you can help people through those times, but you can't take their burdens away from them. Once you start doing that, that's more in like the codependency realm. Knowing your boundaries is a big one. 
and enforcing the boundaries, knowing what your boundaries are, enforcing those boundaries, knowing what you want to do, what you don't want to do, enforcing that. But uh, you just don't do whatever you want to do. You also have a healthy sense of uh, what's healthy for you to be doing. Okay, You're not destructive about it, but you're not doing it because of peer pressure either. And last one, knowing what your needs are and communicating them. When I read about this, I think I've mentioned this before, I didn't know what my needs were. Like I read in a book, like you have to know what your needs are and communicate that. And I was like, I don't know what my needs are. What are my needs? It took me like a year and a half to figure out what my needs were. And turns out one of my needs in the relationships that I'm in is to not feel like I'm alone. Like I need to feel part of something. Like I'm not on my own because I'd felt on my own for a long time. So in relationships, that's just a need I had. And I had to communicate that need to not feel alone. And then I had to figure out like, well, what does that mean? Like, what do I have to do to not feel alone? What do other people have to help me through to not feel alone? So I hope this helps. This is a really complicated subject. Um, A lot of people can get lost. There's lots of different opinions out there. I tried to bring in uh, a lot of science and a lot of research to this. So these aren't just my own opinions. Um, I did a lot of reading around this. And this, a lot of what I'm telling you seems to be more of a consensus rather than just cherry picking what I think is the best. So I hope this helps. Thanks for watching.